Well, good afternoon, and I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this great day with you, this commencement. I'm as happy as any of you out there because, well, because I was invited here today, I will be able to fulfill a lifelong dream. It was my dream while I was sleeping under the dining room table of my aunt's house in Berkeley that one day, that one day, that I would obtain what you are doing here today. It was my dream when I graduated from high school again that as the first member of my family to graduate from high school, that I would one day be where you are. And I wanna let you know how precious it is that you are where you are. But I thank you so much for inviting me in for this memorable day of robe, cap and gown, the music, well, you've made part of my big dream come true just by achieving what you have achieved. To California State Trustee Lawrence Norton, to President Wong, my thanks to you for this privilege of being here, to Stan Mazor and Larry Walden. I am humbled to be in your presence with all you have done for all of us in this world. Also to the assembled faculty, uh, the university staff, the students, the families, friends who are here to support you. I am really pleased that you are here because when all I had to motivate me was my own vision of a life in television news. And the phrase, don't be afraid of that space between your dreams and reality. If you dream it, you can make it so. If you have heard me speak, you have heard it before. The ability to hold on to a vision of what often seems impossible has been my salvation. Because as you can plainly see, I am black, I am female. Those are two socially defining characteristics over which I had absolutely no control. In my lifetime, this could well have meant that many paths would be impossible for me that they did not is a testament to the power of what has come to be known as the American dream. It is a phrase first coined by historian and writer James Streslow Adams in 1931. He meant it not as a vision of affluence, but rather a dream of a social order where people could rise to their full potential, regardless of their race, their gender, and their family's wealth. We are living through a period now where Truslow's dream for America is being challenged and is badly in need of reaffirming. Yes, we've made progress, but in some of the areas where we need to do more, we are failing. We have allowed our educational system to slip to new lows in areas where preparedness is mandatory to a technologically driven world. We have watched as about 15 state governors move to make it harder for us to vote in this country. We have allowed thousands of young black and brown men to be warehoused in prisons with few resources to help them prepare for life outside of the prison walls. We have watched as our climate on our earth has changed. We have walked over the homeless on our streets and scorned them for not shaking the devils that haunt them and their failure in realizing the promise of America. It's time for those of us who can to affirm my belief in the promise of America, to believe in our national pledge of liberty and justice for all. At the time of our greatest depression, President Franklin Roosevelt said, and he called on us then to take action for the good of our nation. As you leave here and move out into the broader world of opportunity, think of those who fought for the funds that made this campus the jewel it is today. Think of those who fought to make what is taught here more inclusive. Think of the talented teachers who chose to invest their intellect in you instead of looking for the highest paying job. It's time to reaffirm our belief in the promise of America. Can that promise be kept if we continue with the increasing inequities that is widening the gap between the rich and the poor. For much of our history since World War II, the richest 10% of Americans have taken home one third of our national income. That is no longer true. Now they take home half of it. 
The top 1% now owns more than the entire bottom 90%. So what's wrong with this picture? Haven't there always been divisions between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have not, and hasn't America survived and been even thrived? And yes, to some degree, the divide between the wealthy and the not so wealthy has been seen as a driving force and incentive to work harder and to be creative. But when inequality of income and wealth becomes too great, it threatens the foundation of this country and our economy our ideals of equal opportunity, and if allowed to continue, our democracy. So are we supposed to give up on our dreams? If we have the misfortune to be born poor, supposed to face forever a life of limited means, limited choices, and a limited future, I say to you, no. We have been threatened times before and have come up with solutions like Social Security for the elderly, like unemployment for those who are temporarily out of work, like Medicare and Medicaid, and in our times, the Affordable Care Act, which we're told has now enrolled some 8 million people and given many of them access to health care for the first time in their lives. What all of these solutions have in common is the view that we are all in this life together. And sometimes, when inequities, we, we have to take positions and step up to fix them. We have to take affirmative action. I know that term has become one of the most polarizing in the American political dictionary. My husband, Bill Moore, and I recently had the opportunity to lunch with one of the most passionate believers in affirmative action. She is Justice Sonia Sotomayor. We had lunch with her in her chambers at the U.S. Supreme Court just last month. We did not know that just two weeks later, the Supreme Court would issue its decision upholding a Michigan law that bans affirmative action. We did not know that Justice Sotomayor would make the longest, most passionate, and most significant dissent of her career in this case. At the time, we were just two elderly, black, non-college graduates talking and laughing over life and its twist and turn with a Supreme Court justice, a graduate of Princeton, of Yale Law School, who happened also to be a Puerto Rican woman from a Bronx housing project. I think we all knew that there are not many places in the world where you could have that kind of interaction between people like us. So when I read her dissent in the Michigan case, I could hear her voice in my head. While our Constitution does not guarantee minority groups victory in the political process, she wrote, it does guarantee them meaningful and equal access to that process. And that, in its simplest terms, is the American dream. Meaningful and equal access, not just to the political process, but also the greater process of living together as equals. And living together takes affirmative action on the part of all of us. If we take affirmative action to engage with our families, our friends, and our neighbors, our world view opens outward. If enough people do it, it can lead to the most irresistible force we have come to know as a movement. Robert Reich, former Labor Secretary and current Chancellor Professor of Public Policy at UC Berkeley has said, we need a movement for shared prosperity. And he is right. He put it this way, time and again, when the situation demands it, America has saved capitalism from its own excesses. The simple truth is, if we want to preserve America as we know it, we must take positive steps, affirmative action, to reverse the trend toward even greater inequities and turn instead toward shared prosperity. Which brings me back to the here and the now, 
this school provides a quality education second to none. You have only to look at the achievements of those who studied here and who teach here. As we face a possible crisis, I look to you for leadership and the vision to sense the future. I have nothing but awe for this student body and your ability to lead, to help, to guide us on a path that is inclusive. I know that a high percentage of you have attended school while simultaneously holding down jobs. I know that many of you have commuted long distances daily. The fact is that this is a diverse student body that has its own importance. It means that the knowledge that you've acquired in your time here is not just from books. Also, it comes from your exposure to each other. So I hope that you will use your education and your experience to take affirmative action and influence our society and our politics for the better. For if a movement for shared prosperity is ever to start on a school where so much has started, it's right here, it's right now, is with you and what you do to keep this school great. I will be, it will be easier and more effective for your generation to reach out to one another than any generation that's come before. And it's in that that I hold high hopes. The great theologian, Dr. Howard Thurman, in his book, The Inward Journey, wrote, dreams belong to us. They come full blown out of the real world in which we work, hope, and carry on. They are not impositors. They are not foreign elements invading our world like some solitary comet from the outer reaches of space which pays one visit to the sun and is gone never to come again. No, our dreams are our thing. They become the other only when we let them lose their character. Please don't let your dreams or those of this amazing country lose their character. We cannot afford to forget the promise of America. Thank you and congratulations.